Dr. Paula Gordon and Dr. Larry Goldenberg are the epitome of a power couple. Paula has been on the leading edge of women's health with her fight against breast cancer. Her research and very early use of mammograms has won her international respect and accolades. Interestingly, Larry has received similar recognition and awards for his work in men's health. His research and determination have led to the Prostate Center at Vancouver General Hospital being considered one of the best programs in the world. Both have received the Order of British Columbia and the Order of Canada, recognizing their work on prevention and early detection of cancer. Paula Gordon, Larry Goldenberg. So you are role models, each in your own way, like Paula with women's health and Larry with men's health. How did each of you decide that medicine was going to be your career? I think I was born Dr. Goldenberg. Yes? Actually. <laughs> you yes. came out with a stethoscope? In, in utero. I was, it was predetermined. Yes. Why? Um, you know, my, my parents are both, both uh, Holocaust survivors, my late dad and my mom. And uh, when they, they came to Canada in 1949, they met and were married in 1950, and I was born soon afterwards. Uh, but, you know, they wanted their children to have the education that basically was denied to them by, by Hitler. You know, my dad was uh, a very traditional Jewish man, and he believed in the, in the um, you know, the tenets of Judaism, really, the education, work, and charity. And those were instilled in me. And I, as I grew older and found a love for science, it became pretty apparent that medicine was the way to go. So that's how I got into medicine. You, Paula? Very different. Uh, my parents were both born in Canada, uh, and they were depression babies. Um, my mother uh, always felt that a woman should be able to support herself and not rely on being supported. So there was never any question that I would have a profession. I started part-time jobs when I was 15, and I worked about 20 hours a week all through high school and university. Even in medical school, I was still working part-time. But I didn't actually decide on medicine until I was about 15 years old. Um, my father hardly knew any. My father was a surgeon. But there were very few women physicians. There certainly weren't very many that he could see as appropriate role models for me. And um, I, at one point, said, maybe I'll be a nurse. And my father said, well, if you want to be a nurse, at least be a damn good one. But it was my mother who said, don't be a nurse. You can be a doctor. And uh, she encouraged me. And um, we met an undergraduate. Uh, University of Toronto, and we're in the same medical school class. And so um, we were next to each other at, in organic chemistry in second year because our last names were alph alphabetical order, Gordon and Goldenberg. And um, we got to know each other just we were in the same classes. I thought she looked really nerdy with those glasses on. <laughs> <laughs> but I fell in love with her anyways. So looking back on a career in medicine, um, is, has it been everything that you were dreaming about or hoping about? I didn't actually have a dream. I didn't know where I was going to end up. Um, well, even Larry, you, you started out wanting to be an orthopedic surgeon. He's jock. So I was really into sports medicine and thought I'd go down that path. And then I met a senior resident in urology, and he convinced me that orthopedic surgeons have to get up at night to fix arms and legs and fractures and stuff, but urologists can usually sleep through the night. So I said, sounds like a plan. <laughs> and then I met some others. And Paula's dad was a urologist who never tried to influence me to go into that field, but obviously was delighted when I decided to do urology. And now we have a son who's a urologist, so there's three generations. Yeah. 
It's interesting because both of you have been heavily involved in research in both of your, your areas. And research almost always leads to public policy issues. So I'm gonna ask you both the same question. <laughs> so Paula, public policy is difficult at the best of times, but what were the challenges that you particularly faced? I'm still facing them big time. I do breast radiology. Some of my colleagues say that's all you do, um, but it's fabulous. And I do interventions, so I do a lot of ultrasound guided needle biopsies. But the whole issue of screening mammography, what age to start, how often to do it, has been an ongoing, I don't want to say it's, a, it's not really a controversy, but it's debated. And it's not debated well. There, the, the, my mentors are the people who were the ones who started doing screening mammography in the 60s and 70s. And um, our program in British Columbia started in the 80s. But it's been an ongoing battle. We're so lucky in our province that women can start at 40. But that's only the case in four provinces. Alberta starts at 45 and the rest of the country starts at 50. And I wish public policy was decided on the basis of experts and research. But that's not what happens in Canada. So um, what happens? you have to say it in the present tense, not the past tense. Oh, that's a whole conversation. Um, long story short, there is a panel in Canada that's federally funded called the Canadian Task Force on Preventive Health Care, and they make guidelines. And they're, they're presented as being experts, but they're not. They're family doctors, they're nurses. The task force committee that made the current breast screening guidelines was chaired by a nephrologist, that's a kidney specialist, and there was even an occupational therapist and a chiropractor involved. There were no breast surgeons, no oncologists, no breast radiologists. And they chose the wrong research to use as the basis for their guidelines. And so confusing for women because you think, oh, you're supposed to start at 40. Oh, no, now you have to wait till 50. And then, oh, no, we're going back to 40. And they never say when you should stop. Well, that's another conversation. So right now, the screening programs typically tell women they don't have to have mammograms after 74. Well, that's only because the trials that were done from the 60s to the 80s only recruited women up to the age of 74. That doesn't mean women shouldn't have it. It just means nobody's ever studied it that way. Uh, experts believe that women should keep going for screening mammograms as long as they're in good health with a life expectancy of 10 years. Larry, I'm sure in your area of men's health generally, you have the same kind of bumping up against public policy. Absolutely, I mean, very much in parallel, we have PSA screening for prostate cancer and the controversies around early detection, over diagnosis. I think the real controversy is over treatment and we've been addressing that in our profession for the last 20 years with something called active surveillance for men who have very low risk, low stage, early cancer that probably won't impact on their longevity. Most urological societies agree that men at the age of 50 should at least have their first screen of PSA, looking for possibility of a prostate problem. I, you know, if a man has a family history, I would start earlier. So, you know, I don't have to go into the great details. But, you know, from a public policy point of view, when I started the Men's Health Foundation, the Canadian Men's Health Foundation 10 years ago, I thought one of the first tasks we need to do is create a public policy for men's health. And then I spoke to someone in government who said to me, you know, a better approach rather than trying to get a men's health policy is work from the outside. Stay outside of government, tell them what you need, go to government with specific projects, with specific goals and ask for help with those particular goals. Don't try to create a whole policy. So I just avoided this whole policy approach. I thought, I don't have the time or the patience for that. I wanna treat men, I wanna get the information out there that men need. And uh, that's been my approach to policy. And then on another way, to, you know, in, in urology itself, uh, back in 1985, 86, I proposed a new treatment for a procedure in urology called a transurethral resection of the prostate, which is a procedure done for men who have urinary voiding issues. 
and it was the bread and butter of urology. And I came up against the culture of resistance to um, new technology and innovation, like I did not know existed. And that resistance is still in today's culture in, in the world of medicine. It's amazing. And between a, a physician who has an idea and maybe a newer treatment, something good, and, and getting that implemented in policy, I mean, the layers of bureaucracy have grown so thick over the last 30 years that it's impossible to negotiate. That culture of resistance still exists. And I, I'd say it's one of the biggest frustrations I've had in my career, trying to, to negotiate that. And my answer, my approach to that, work around it. Of course, you also have to deal with headlines in papers, for instance. You know the science, you know what your patients need, and then there'll be headlines saying, oh, well, there are too many false positives in both your tests that you're yeah. talking about, right? And people say, well, we wouldn't want people, women, guys, to go home worried about something when they maybe don't have it. Well, women... Well, the overdiagnosis, the so-called, oh. or, I mean, it, you no, want no, to address what, the, the, the false, false positive oh, okay, in, in You breast. can talk about overdiagnosis. Okay. False positive, first of all, it's a pejorative term. What we're talking about is when somebody has a screening test and there's something abnormal that needs more tests, the term false positive implies that we told you that you have cancer. And that's not true. There are lots of things that show up that need more tests. In the breast, for example, there are cysts. There are non-cancerous lumps. So we call them false alarms. Some of my colleagues prefer the term a recall or recall for additional testing. And the numbers are that out of every thousand women who have a screening mammogram, 93% it's negative, 7% or uh, 70 women out of a thousand are going to be recalled for more testing. Most of them just need an extra mammogram picture. Some of them need an ultrasound. 11 of them, 11 out of the 1,000 original women, 11 out of the 70 recalled women are told they need a needle biopsy. Now, it sounds scary, but it's really a little bit more glamorous than a blood test from the arm. It's practically painless. And four of those women, four of the 11, are going to be diagnosed with breast cancer. And the good news is that we found it early. When women hear that the reason they're being denied screening is because some panel thought that they shouldn't have to tolerate some transient anxiety from being recalled, women are furious. They say, I can handle a little transient anxiety. What I can't handle is a late diagnosis of cancer because you wouldn't let me be screened. And that's what it comes down to. The task force would rather save a handful of women some transient anxiety, even though they know that by not screening women, there will be more avoidable deaths. False positive... But the real challenge is overdiagnosis. And that's because prostate cancers don't all behave the same. And we use an analogy to a barnyard. You know, you have a barnyard with a bunny rabbit, a turtle, and a bird. And you walk it in, up to the barnyard, the bird's gonna fly away. You might catch it, there's a good chance, or there's a chance you can catch it. The turtle will probably start moving around a little bit, might find its way out of the barnyard. But the bunny rabbit's gonna start hopping and could very well find its way out. So if you think of cancer being a barnyard if, analogy where you don't want the cancer cells to leave the barnyard, you want to capture it while it's still there, we're looking for the bunny rabbits. Okay? It'd be nice to find the, the birds before when they were bunny rabbits, five years before. But when we find the turtles, rabbits? well, whatever. <laughs> but, <laughs> but when we find the turtles, we want to watch them. We're not going to treat them, you know, we're, we're going to watch. And that's what active surveillance is. And that's really changed the way that we approach prostate cancer. Amazing when you're talking about these things, how much it's about technology. And think of when you both started and how the tools that are available to you now are, are so different. When I started in 1984, um, we, did, we didn't have blood tests to detect prostate cancer, we would do the digital rectal examination and usually the cases we found were more advanced. Like in breast, once there's a lump there that you can feel, it's a more advanced disease. And I remember the first biopsies I was doing, it was before ultrasound was available, you were just doing them just by feel and using needles and um, 
then ultrasound came along and we started do, using ultrasound to look for cancers and then CT scans and now MRIs. So yeah, it's totally changed, but you, you, know, you change with the times, if you will, right? You learn to use that technology. It's... But going back to when I started in practice, we had mammography and um, it wasn't the same caliber as we have now, of course, but when we saw something on a mammogram, we had to make a decision just based on that, whether a woman needed an operation to have a biopsy, because we weren't doing needle biopsies back then, um, not, not of things that were too small to feel. I mean, if a woman came in with a big lump, uh, the doctor could hold the lump in their hand and put a needle, they hoped, into the right place. And then we learned how to use the ultrasound to make sure we were putting the needle exactly in the right place to sample a lump. And then the needles got better and... and um... So my very modest wife, she was one of the first in the world to describe this, to use ultrasound in the breast, which is now a standard of care around the world. You Larry, talk about... Per- let me ask about yeah. men particularly, because there's a reluctance often Absolutely. for men to think about going to see a doctor or keeping yeah. their health... So know. let me tell you a short story about why I, I started the Men's Health Foundation about 10, 11 years ago. You know, what's a urologist doing with general men's health, the cardiac health, diabetes, mental health, and so on? I had a patient, and I was doing a vasectomy on him, and we're talking, you know, you chat about the Blue Jays, the Canucks, and stuff, and I asked him what, if he had a family history of colon cancer, and he had no idea. I said, is your father alive? Yeah. I said, why don't you ask him? The fact that people don't know their family history really startled me, and I thought, wait a minute. And then Desmond Tutu said once, he said, why are we pulling all these people out of the river? We should be going upstream and figuring out why they're jumping into the river. And 70% of chronic illnesses can be prevented by upstream behavioral modification, health changes, habits changes. And so we started this program of educating men and their partners. The women or their partners are critically important to get men to go to the doctor particularly if you're talking guys in their 20s and 30s and 40s. They just, they're, whether they're too busy or they've got this ingrained concept that men are invincible, nothing's going to happen to me. Well, when they turn 60 or 70, they wish that they had changed their behaviors back when they were 30. So we're, we in, in, have an intense program of awareness to try to get men to change. We called it Don't Change Much. Because that's the other thing, men don't want to, you know, you go to a 30-year-old and you say, well, i got to get you to stop smoking, drink less, exercise more. You know, they're going to go like, well, yeah, okay. But if you say, you know, half fries, half salad, cut your beers down from three to two, you know, uh, park your car a little bit further away from the office, take the stairs, not the elevator, small changes. That became very successful. Some of our research has shown that only 7% of Canadian men are very healthy, okay? 40% are okay, reasonably good health, but 50% are either in poor health or very poor health. That's a lot of men, okay? So we've got a lot of work ahead of us to, to you know, continue to, to try to address health behavior in the 20-year-olds and the 30-year-olds and the 40-year-olds. So it's a matter of education and awareness for men. But this has to start with much younger people. Men well, there are programs in Italy that it start in high school. So do you remember what health class was when we were in junior high and high school? Yeah. I mean, we know that, that for example, I'm sorry, my, my world is breast cancer, that there are some factors that will increase a woman's risk above average to get breast cancer. And we know that if, if uh, young girls adopted these good behaviors probably the majority of breast cancers could be prevented. Yes. Specifically what? Um, uh, Maintaining a healthy body weight, moderate exercise, avoiding alcohol. Nobody likes to hear that one, but alcohol is a carcinogen. The new Canadian guidelines are that more than two drinks a week is risky. So let me ask you both to step back into the broader context of healthcare in Canada, B.C., um, what would you say, I'll ask you first, Paula, what's the biggest failing of our system? Oh, uh, we don't need it. We, we need more family doctors, big time. 
And family doctors need better training in preventive health care, like you mentioned. Uh, our health care system is built around uh, curing diseases. We've recently, and I'm talking about the last lever, several decades, started screening for diseases earlier, but, but prevention is, uh, is important, and I don't think we do enough of that. I think most people agree that our health care system, when you're in it, is as good as any in the world. And people aren't dropping dead on the streets, because if you have an acute problem, you're getting looked after. The biggest challenge we have is wait times. How do you get into the system? The waits to see an orthopedic surgeon for a hip, and then the, the time from when you've seen the doctor to the time of your surgery. That's a big, big challenge. You know, and then finally, um, the controversy over private versus public. You know, I, it, it's controversial, but I think there is a role for private, act, for private healthcare facilities. Um, it's very controversial, so I'll maybe I better not go down that path too no, far. No, but if we but don't I, talk about it or go reality. down that path, how do you fix things? Yeah, because, I mean, we're one of the only West countries in the Western world that doesn't have you know, parallel insurance and a parallel private system of some, to some degree. And I've got colleagues working in England and in Australia and throughout Europe who are in that kind of a system, and it works just fine. And, uh, you know, people are getting looked after. And this concept of, oh, if you open up private clinics, all the good doctors are going to go there and, and deprive the public system, that hasn't proven to be the case in other countries. And I don't think it would be the case here. There are ways that you can you know, organize it so that that doesn't happen. You both have made such remarkable contributions to our community, our country, medicine in general. How do you hope that you're remembered? I want, to, I want to be remembered as a good dad <laughs> <laughs> for my hockey card collection. <laughs> um, I guess I want to be remembered um, for all the avenues, for, for being able to juggle uh, parenthood with work and to Just being good at what I do. Uh, Paula is a, an amazing role model for women in medicine. That it's possible to be to be a great doctor, an advocate, a wife, and a mother. It's very possible, and and she's been very successful. I think that's what that's what you're going to be remembered. See, I should have. That's the way I should have asked it. So you tell me what <laughs> what Larry should be remembered for. Um. Larry is a very special man. He is the ultimate professional, but he, um, people would be surprised to know what a wonderful husband he is. Um, How good I am at dishes. <laughs> push me out of the way to, to, to wash the dishes. No um, man has ever been shot while washing the dishes. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a Larry expression, yes. Well, thank you both for everything you've done. Thank you. Two of BC's legends, Dr. Paula Gordon and Dr. Larry Goldenberg. <laughs> <laughs>